I want to show you how Christ, in declaring himself to be the Son of Man, has the authority to forgive us. And not only that, he grants us the grace so that we can forgive others. It's a beautiful thing. The book of Luke really is is about learning and confessing who the Son of Man is. Luke 19 and 10, Jesus said that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so forgiveness becomes an essential part of of Christ seeking us and Christ saving us. And I hope that we will rest in that grace of forgiveness today, those who've been forgiven. And I'm also going to challenge you today that, that there may be a person or two in your life that you're struggling to forgive. Maybe today you will realize to the extent that you have experienced such grace is to the extent that you were freely given. So last week we were in Nazareth and Jesus declared his public ministry and he said, I have come to preach the good news of the gospel. And and not only that, I have come to care for the poor and, and for the needy. And then that's exactly what Jesus did. His primary ministry was gospel ministry to preach the gospel to the lost. And right alongside that, it was Jesus's ministry to care for the poor because Jesus came to be the fulfillment of the entire law, to love God, to make his gospel known, to love others. And so he combined this ministry, the proclamation of the gospel with the care of the poor and the needy. And we see him doing that from the very beginning of his ministry to the end. But at Nazareth, he was rejected. His hometown people, they did not want to receive him as anything more than just a builder's son, a carpenter's son. And so Jesus decided to make his way throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and performing miracles. And he found a little city called Capernaum. And he stayed there for a little while. And as usual, Jesus is at church on Saturday, and he's gathering to worship with the other worshipers, and he's invited to teach. And as he's teaching, something interesting began to happen. Uh, People possessed with demons, they began to show up. Now, um, I've had only a very rare occasion where I've experienced this, and it's it's different than your children acting up. I know you think your children are demon-possessed. That's, that's called too much sugar, right? So it's not, that's, that's not it. Uh, but actual demon-possessed individuals, they, they, they were there and, and they would confront Jesus and they would confess the truth about who he was. And then when Jesus then would confront them and rebuke them, he would tell them to be quiet and not make that confession. And that actually happened in in Capernaum where this guy with his demon just stands up and shouts, you are the Holy One of God. You're the Holy One of Israel. I mean, he's agreeing with the Old Testament prophets that that Jesus was the Messiah, the Holy One. And yet Jesus rebuked that, that demon and he told him to be quiet and to leave that individual. And this happened time and time again. There was another time where this demon stands up and and he knew that Jesus was his Lord and his creator. And he says, you, you are the son of God. And Jesus rebuked that demon and told him to, to leave, told him to be quiet. Why is it that the only beings that are making the proper confession of who Jesus was were demons and, and Jesus told him to be quiet? Well, friends, it's because Jesus didn't want to be confessed by these perverted, depraved demons. They were sealed to condemnation. Jesus wanted for his name and his identity to be, to be confessed by people that he had come to die to save. He was waiting people like you and me to make the proper confession of faith. And as Jesus was teaching in the synagogues, He was healing people, I mean, just so many each and every day, uh, beginning in Capernaum with Peter's mother-in-law. She was running a deadly fever, and he rebuked the fever, and and, and it left her. And then every day, just the crowd would bring multitudes of sick and dying individuals, and Jesus would take the time to heal them. 
Hey, Jesus became a very popular individual in Galilee to the point where at times he would have to escape because he didn't want to be made into a celebrity and, and he would escape and find himself out in desert places just spending time alone with the Father. But as Luke records in the latter parts of chapter 4 and chapter 5, the crowds would follow him. They began to follow Jesus and, and again, bringing their sick to him and, and to the point where at the end of chapter 4, Jesus, he says to, to the crowd, listen, I, I've got to spend time in other cities. It is necessary for me to proclaim the good news about the kingdom of God to other towns also because I was sent for this purpose. And so he continued to preach in the synagogues of Judea. Jesus never forgot that his primary purpose is to proclaim the good news of salvation to the people of God. Secondarily, he was there to heal and to care and to feed and to deal with any of the injustice and oppression that people were experiencing, but primarily to love God and to make his gospel known and then to love his neighbor. This was the ministry of Jesus. And then in chapter 5, as Jesus uh, relieves a, a, a man from, from leprosy and begins to call his disciples, he finds himself in a home there in Capernaum. And the crowd then had followed him into this home, and they're crowded into this home along with the Pharisees and the scribes. Chapter 5, verse 17. And on one of those days, while he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there in the house. They had come from every village of Galilee and even from Judea and also from Jerusalem. And the Lord's power was there to heal in that moment. Now, the Pharisees were the self-appointed religious leaders of the day. Actually, now for well over a hundred years, this, this group had sort of taken itself to be the, the um, primary religious leaders of Israel. The word Pharisee means separate, and these, these men lived separated lives because they believed to be holy you had to physically separate yourself from sin. You had to physically separate yourself from sinners. And so they had established all of these rules and regulations so, so they could look holy to the people. And then there was this group called the scribes. In my translation, it says they are the teachers of the law. And sure enough, that's what scribes did. They spent their day interpreting Scripture and copying Scripture and, and teaching Scripture. I mean, they knew our Old Testament up one side, down the other. And so when you take the scribes and the Pharisees and, and you combine them together, you've got a, a pretty powerful group. The problem was they were lost. They were completely and utterly lost, and they did not understand the good news of salvation that was contained within the Bible. They had just turned the Bible into be a religious manual, and they felt they had lived it out better than anyone else. Well, now here comes Jesus. And, and they wouldn't have paid any mind to Jesus, just another crazy teacher, another fanatic, except for the fact that Jesus was performing miracles. And the crowds had taken notice of Jesus. And then they also... Notice that whenever Jesus taught, it was different than whenever they taught. You see, they taught the scriptures, and the scriptures contain authority. But when Jesus taught, he taught as if he had authority. He taught as one with authority, which, by the way, whenever you share the gospel with someone, whenever you have the opportunity to, to teach the truth of God's word, do you know you have the same authority that Jesus had? You have the same authority. And you should humbly yet boldly teach with authority as well. Well, Jesus taught in a way that amazed the crowds. Combine that with all of his miracles, and now you get the sense where the Pharisees and the scribes, they begin to pay attention to Jesus. But the other problem was, Jesus' gospel was different than theirs. 
Theirs was based on looking holy and doing things to be holy, where Jesus was talking more about the heart. And so, rather than coming to Jesus and wondering, maybe you are the Messiah, you're doing all the things and saying all the things that the Messiah is supposed to do and say, they decided to oppose him. They decided to, to, to follow him to see if, what did he say that we can contradict? How can we prove that he, he is just a, a fanatic? And eventually they decided, what must we do to kill this man? But they were there. And now Luke records, even early in Jesus' ministries, these Pharisees and scribes from Galilee, even all the way to Judea, even all the way from the capital city, Jerusalem itself, They kept following Jesus around, and there they were inside this crowded house on that that day. And as Jesus was teaching, verse 18, just then some men came carrying a stretcher of a man who was paralyzed. And they tried to bring him in and set him down before him, but since they couldn't find a way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof And they lowered him on the stretcher through the roof tiles into the middle of the crowd right before Jesus. (laughs) What an interesting thing happened in that crowded house that afternoon. Now, uh, Jesus was in a typical uh, Jewish home in Nazareth, not a big city. It would have been a a one-bedroom flat connected to other one-bedroom flats, sort of like little tiny townhomes, if you would. And typically, uh, a normal Jewish home would just be uh, one level with a main room and cut up, divided just maybe a a couple of times for a place to cook. And and there would be a family bed for people to rest and maybe a few chairs, a very simple place. Often there would be next to the home a lean-to, a little shed, if you would, maybe a, a covering and some posts and a fence so that if they were able to have a lamb or a goat or a couple of animals, they could keep them there safely. And at times even they'd cut a hole in the wall and, and put food out in a manger or a trough for the, for the sheep to feed. Now, the flat roofs of that time were made of thatch, and then they would take mud and attach it to the thatch and sticks, and, and they would keep piling this up until it was waterproof. And even on occasion, if they had some old salt, they would love to put the the, the old salt on top of the roof to, to make it firm so you could actually walk on top of the roof because on a cool Galilean night, it was wonderful to take a chair and to sit up on top of the roof. And for certain homes, there would be on top of the roof a, a guest room. They would actually build a small little square room so that if family or friends or travelers, because according to the law, if anybody shows up at your home, you have to offer them a room to stay. That, that was the law. And so they would have a place where if a guest could, could, you know, could sleep at night, and of course, again, they would enjoy the, the cool evening air, and this place was called a guest room, or sometimes it was simply called the inn. So, Way back when Jesus was born, most likely what happened was as Mary and Joseph show up to Bethlehem and Mary is very pregnant and she only has hours before she's going to deliver her baby, Joseph goes to all of the family that they are attached to in Bethlehem and they go to the houses and they say, is there any room in your spare bedroom? To which they said, no, that's been filled already because of the census, we're completely overcrowded. And they couldn't find any guest room anywhere in Bethlehem for Mary to have this child. And so eventually Joseph had to decide, well, this is the best we can do. We're going to have to have the baby in the shed, in the lean-to. And sure enough, they found that and Mary had the child and placed the baby in the sheep's manger there amongst a very busy Bethlehem night, which I know maybe destroys your manger scene this Christmas, but this is probably most likely what happens. It wasn't a holiday inn that they couldn't get into. There were no holiday inns and probably not a cave, some tradition states. No, it was probably no room in the spare bedroom. Well, on this occasion, 
as Jesus was teaching in the main room, the main living area of this house, and, and the crowds were there, amongst them were the Pharisees and the scribes, all of a sudden they heard some noise up on the roof, and, and then they saw some dust begin to, to come down, and all of a sudden they saw sunlight. And they saw men tearing away at the roof tiles to the point where there was a hole big enough to, to, to actually lower this, this man down. Now, Luke doesn't record the reaction of the homeowner in this moment. Although, when my children were small, we had this cheesy video um, of Christian stories, and they were done by puppets. And I, and I remember one of the stories, because it was about this homeowner, this poor man, and he was a puppet, and he was all distraught, and he, was, he had his hand on his head, and what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And he, and he sung this song. He said, there's a hole in my roof. It's the truth. I wouldn't spoof. It was put there by a man with diseases, and they lowered him down to see Jesus. So obviously that must have been true, that there was a man and he was upset because the, you know, the puppet said it. Well, there was something about the persistent faith of these men, these friends, of this paralyzed man that Jesus took notice of. Not only their faithfulness to somehow figure out, okay, how are we going to get our friend to see Jesus? We can't go in the front door. Oop, here's the stairs up to the, the roof. Let's take him up there. And now what are we going to do? Well, let's just tear a hole in this place. There was, there was something about the faithfulness of, of these friends to lower their friend down to see Jesus, but, but there was also something about the actual faith that they had in Jesus, that Jesus took notice of. Because in verse 20, it says, seeing their faith, Jesus said, friend, your sins are forgiven. That small verse is one of my absolute favorite verses in all of the Bible. Friend, your sins are forgiven. What more could God say to you than that? What, what more could Jesus say to you and call you his friend and tell you your sins? are forgiven. Friends, I'm telling you, to meditate on that and that alone could transform your life. Do you know that the Almighty wants to be your friend? He wants to have that type of relationship with you. And do you know the Almighty wants to forgive you? Friends, your sins are forgiven. You see, Jesus, he saw more than a paralyzed man before him. No, the Son of Man looked deeper down through the marrow of this man's heart and soul, and he saw faith. That oh so important gift of God's grace, faith. He saw it. And he he went beyond his paralysis and, and he saw the, 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 the one thing, the only thing that, that could overcome this, uh, this, this person's lostness, the, the only thing that could overcome his, his weakness. Jesus saw in these men the very thing that freed him up to forgive them. He saw belief. They believed. Jesus could provide healing, not only for the limbs of this paralyzed man, but healing for their paralyzed souls. I, I want you to be like these men. You know, I find interesting that we're going to see, as we study Luke, several instances where Jesus forgives. 
I love stories of forgiveness. And, and here's the thing. It's interesting that every time we see a story about forgiveness in the Bible, the person is desperate. There's a sense of desperation in their faith. This paralyzed man, how are we going to get this person to see Jesus? They were desperate. They were willing to tear apart a roof to get their friend down. Later, we'll see a, a prostitute. And she, she risks embarrassment and, and even physical harm, forcing her way to the feet of Jesus. Then we're going to see a, a desperate, tiny little tax collector that everybody hated. And he, he climbed a tree and he cried out to Jesus. He demanded that Jesus stop and pay attention to him. There's, there's something about faith. But listen, then there's something else about desperate faith. Desperate faith that I, I, I want you to have. And as I say, because if, if, if you've been a Christian for a while, you've probably taken faith for granted. I know I, I tend to do that. I take my salvation for granted. I'm saved. Great. Yes, faith. Of course I believe. But if it loses its desperateness, if it loses its persistence, then, then, then you may fail to, to, to know how incredible it is for God to say, friend, I forgive you. Don't ever take that for granted. I think a desperate faith is the type of faith that can move a mountain. I think a desperate faith is the type of faith that allows you to relish in the grace of God when you know you're forgiven. And Jesus saw that. And, 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 and he, he announced that. He called this paralyzed man his friend. How can you have more of a desperate faith? That's something I want you to chew on this week. Well, Amongst these crowded people, obviously now they're thinking, what is taking place here? What is happening? I mean, out from this roof comes down this man who was paralyzed right before Jesus was probably sitting down there in the midst. And so Luke records the reaction of the Pharisees. And the Pharisees and the scribes began to think to themselves, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? I mean, who, who can forgive sins? but God alone. I mean, obviously in this moment, the Pharisees were more provoked by Jesus' statement than this paralyzed man who, who had descended from the roof. But rightly so. Because the Pharisees understood their Bible. They knew that only God can forgive sins. They had read the prophet Isaiah who records the Lord saying, I am God and I alone, who blots out your sins for my own name's sake. They knew the Bible told us and taught us that, that only God can forgive sins. And so in their minds, they concluded that Jesus was a blasphemer who in this moment had committed a grave sin against God. They didn't have the faith of the paralyzed man. No, their hearts remained paralyzed. But just as Jesus could see through the man's paralysis down to the living faith of this man, Jesus also could look into the hearts of the Pharisees, which, by the way, he did often. And at times, he let us know what he saw when he looked into the heart of these religious hypocrites. He said, they're nothing but whitewashed tombs, looking holy on the outside, but completely dead on the inside. He saw that. And in verse 22, Jesus, knowing their thoughts, which probably shocked them when he told them what they were thinking, he replies to them and he says, why are you thinking all of this in your hearts? I mean, at some point in time, you'd think the Pharisee would go, okay, you do miracles. You are now reading my mind. Maybe you are the Messiah. 
But no. No, Jesus could see the unbelief. Jesus could see the doubt. Jesus could see the only thing that would keep these Pharisees from heaven. And that's a rejection of who he is. You see, friends, the Bible soberly talks about a sin that is not pardonable. The Bible talks about a sin that can keep you from heaven. And there's just one. There's only one sin that can keep you from heaven, and that's unbelief. It's to reject Jesus as the Son of God, who is our Savior. To not believe that, to reject that, is the only thing that can keep you from a heaven forever, but it is the very thing that God will use to judge you on the day of judgment, because on that day, On that day, at the end of all things, God will separate all of humanity, those who believe and those who don't. And that's it. What Jesus saw in the hearts of the Pharisees was unbelief. I don't want for Christ to see that in yours. And if he does, maybe today would be the day when you believe and place your faith in Jesus Christ for the forever forgiveness and salvation of your souls. That, my friends, is free for your asking, for your confessing, if you believe. Well, instead, Jesus, he takes the unbelief in the minds of these Pharisees, and he just pulls it out of them, and he lays it on the table. And he says, okay, then put me to the test. Is it easier for me to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say to him, get up and walk out of here? Which is easier? So he he, he places the Pharisees in a a conundrum. And and in, in doing this, Jesus was doing more than putting the Pharisees to a test. You've got to remember that every time he confronted the Pharisees and their false gospel. And their false religion, he knew that one day those Pharisees would make sure he was nailed to a cross and put to death. He knew what he was doing. It was not easy for Jesus to make these statements. Jesus had to be willing to receive punishment in order for us to be provided forgiveness. And so he lays down this challenge to the Pharisees. And they didn't even have to respond Because he knew their thought was, well, it's easier for you to say your sins are forgiven because how would we know? It would be harder for you to say, get up and walk. Verse 24, Jesus says, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth. That's, I want you to underline that. You got your cool notebooks we gave you a couple weeks ago. Underline that. I want you to think about that a lot. The Son of Man has authority. Everything else is a religion. This is Christianity. This is a living faith because our leader has divine authority to forgive sins. Everything else is a belief system. No matter what religion you're talking about, what faith system you're talking about, Jesus is saying, I'm different. I have authority from God on this earth. And this is the first place where he describes himself as the son of man. He will do it two dozen other times. When he calls himself the son of man, he's saying, I'm the son of man. Of all of mankind, I'm unique. Even Adam, the son of God, I was before that. I am the son of man. I have divine authority to forgive. 
And so he told the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your stretcher, and go home. The guy gets up, and all of a sudden he, he feels life in his legs. He flips him over that uh, stretcher and feels like, okay, stands up, grabs that stretcher, and out he goes. Probably whistles to his friends. They scuffle down, out they go. Maybe apologize to the homeowner. I don't know. Immediately, he goes home, and they went home glorifying God. And everyone was astounded. And everybody in the house, aside from the Pharisees and teachers of the law, they were giving glory to God, and they were filled with awe and said, we have seen incredible things today. That paralyzed, now walking man of faith had a story to tell. Now, this was his story of, of forgiveness. And we all have a story to tell. If you're a Christian, you have a story to tell about the grace of God's forgiveness in your life. Now, I love it when, you, when I hear your story. They're all different. And yet they all, at some point, have the same thing in common. <laughs> we were desperate. We cried out to God. And we believe that Jesus is the Son of Man and has authority to forgive, and he forgave us. But that's the story that we all need to tell. And in this day, the entire house erupted in giving praise to God. Now, the revelation of the Son of Man, that we know that he has authority to forgive, right? This is how it works. Only God can forgive. Jesus proved himself to have authority to forgive. Jesus is God. That's how it works. If you're doubting, if you have friends who doubt, remind them, only God can forgive. Jesus proved his authority to forgive. That makes Jesus God. That makes him God. You know, the irony of all of this is the Pharisees thought it would be easier for Jesus to say, your sins are forgiven, than for him to say, get up and, and walk. But the fact is, Jesus knew it was completely the opposite. It was easy for Jesus to say to this, this paralytic, get up and walk. I mean, he had been empowered by God's Spirit to perform all kinds of miracles. No, actually, what was really difficult for Jesus is to say to the man, your sins are forgiven, because Jesus understood that each and every sin of that paralyzed man would have to be paid for one day when he hung on the cross. God just can't forgive your sin. Jesus has to pay for those sins on the cross. You know, I realized something that I have been neglecting in my prayer time. Because in my prayer time, I'm, I'm always asking, forgive me, forgive me for this, forgive me for that. Yesterday, I'm, I'm stopping and I'm praying, I'm saying, God, oh, forgive me for these thoughts. Would you forgive me? Forgive me for this attitude. Just forgive me. But, but then I reminded myself as I'm saying, God, forgive me. And oh, by the way, Jesus, I know for that which I'm being forgiven cost you your life and your shed blood on the cross. Jesus, thank you for bleeding and for suffering and for dying for me. Because you see, the Son of Man who has the authority to forgive is also the man of sorrows. The man of sorrows who provided our forgiveness on the cross. Down at that cross, we sing this song, where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing of sin I cry, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. We have to give God the glory just as that paralyzed man and his friends gave God the glory that day because on the cross, Jesus paid and purchased us from our sin. And now we have what we, what we affectionately call a double cure. If you believe 
and you've been forgiven, you've been cured twice. First of all, you've been cured from the wrath of God. If you have made a proper confession of faith and asked God to forgive you, and he has, you will not have to face God on the day of judgment. He's cured you from his wrath. That's the first cure. What's the second? He's cured you from living for yourself. And he's cured you from being unforgiving. He's cured you so that you can forgive just as you have been forgiven. And by the way, when you forgive like Jesus forgives, it changes your heart. It changes you. That's why when Jesus taught us to pray, he said, pray this way. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. The double cure. We're forgiven. We have the ability to forgive. Be kind and merciful, Paul said to the church at Ephesus, and forgive others in the very same way that God has forgiven you. Not in your way. So many people fool around with forgiveness. The only real forgiveness is the way God forgives. And we must forgive others to the same veracity and strength and truth that God forgave us. The author of the letter to the Hebrews said to the church, as a reminder from the Old Testament prophets, the Lord saying, I will forgive their wrongdoing and I will never again remember their sins. You see, when you're forgiven by God, he chooses never to remember your sins again. Never. Could he recall your sin? Of course, he could recall each and every one, but he chooses not to remember. Now, friends, that is the grace of forgiveness. And that's how God wants you to forgive others. Here at Open Door, we talk about the promises of forgiveness. Whenever someone asks you to forgive them, if they've offended you, if they've sinned against you, and you're willing to forgive them back, you are making these four promises. The first is this. I promise that I will no longer dwell against your sin against me. I'm not going to think about it anymore. I'm not going to recall it in my mind. Like God, I'm going to choose not to remember. The second promise is, I promise that I will not bring up your sin again and use it against you. There's never going to be a time when, when, when you sin against me again that I will say, oh, see, there you go again. That's so you. I'm not going to bring it up again because God doesn't bring my past sin up against me. The third promise is, I'm not going to talk to others about your sin. It's not going to become juicy gossip. Or because I'm hurting, I'm going to find someone to, to confide in, and part of my confiding in them is tell them how bad you were to me. I'm not going to do that. No. no this is just between us. And this is over between us. And finally, I promise that I will not let your sin stand between us or hinder our relationship because, friends, imagine, imagine if, if Jesus said to you, I can't have a relationship with you until you recognize how much you've hurt me. I, I, I can't call you a friend until I know, I really know how much you've offended me. Now, you know what? I, I can't forgive you, right? Because I, I still am waiting for you to fully appreciate the offense against me. If Jesus were to do that, you'd never be forgiven. You'd never be forgiven. No, no, rather. Here's what Jesus does. He says, I, I know you will never know how much you've offended me. 
And I know that you will never be able to confess the extent of your sin against me. But I will not allow this to hinder our relationship. In fact, the very first thing that I will say when I'm nailed to the cross, is a plea to my heavenly father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Of all the difficult meetings I've had in ministry, and I've had some difficult ones, I, I might say to you that the most difficult meetings that I've had are sitting around a table of someone who claims Christ and yet refuses to forgive. They claim Christ, and someone is asking for their forgiveness, and they refuse to grant it. And I just think, how is that possible? How is that possible? How can you, who have been forgiven so much, forgive so little? And I just wonder, how do you live with yourself? What sort of tortured existence do you have harboring unforgiveness in your heart? Now, I'm, I'm asking you that because I can't see your soul like Jesus can. But I'm wondering, do some of you harbor that bitterness of unforgiveness to this day? And if you do, maybe today, you would say, I'm done with I can't do this anymore. There'll never be a time when the person who's offended me will fully appreciate all they've done or how much they've hurt me. But you know what, God, you understand. You know, and that's enough. And I'll never understand how much I've offended you, Lord. But you know what? You, you look at me and you see my faith and you call me your friend. And you send your son to pay the price so that you and I can have a right relationship, that I can be freely forgiven. So yes, I will experience the double cure. I'll receive forgiveness from you, and I will live a life freely forgiving others. Let's pray. Now, oh, fathers easier for me to preach this than to do it. So let's begin with where you began. You forgave us. And from the foundation of the world, you knew that you would have to send your son to pay the price for our sin. You, you were claiming us as your children, as your friends, before you made anything. Now, Father, here we are once again in need of forgiveness, in need of this grace. And Father, I pray today that we also would make this confession. We will be forgiving of others. The same grace that we have experienced, we will give away freely. And Father, I pray that we would all celebrate the freedom and the liberality of forgiving others. That we would live with, with clean hands and pure hearts before others. And so, Father, to the extent that we have been, may we be and become. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.